<laughs> Voice amplification. <laughs> It's so great to be back here in New Hampshire. Tracy, you missed the most important thing. I graduated from Phillips Exeter Academy in 1992. <laughs> That's a pretty tepid applause. <laughs> Some people here are like, PEA. It's OK. I was invited back to speak at PEA a number of months ago. And when I spoke, I said, this is my first time back since I graduated because I didn't enjoy myself here. And the student body erupted in applause. <laughs> and I felt really bad. I was like, that wasn't the reaction I was going for. And as Tracy said, after I graduated from Exeter, I went to Brown and then Columbia. And then I became an unhappy lawyer in New York City for five months. And that sometimes gets a laugh from people. <laughs> And I left the firm to try and start a business. How many of you, because this is the Chamber of Commerce, how many of you have started a business or organization or club or list? So if you have your hand up, you know two things. Number one, it's much harder than anyone lets on. And number two, when someone asks you how it's going, what do you say? Great. Great. <laughs> Everything's always going great. My business went great until it failed. My parents told people I was still a lawyer because it was a much easier story. <laughs> but I'd been bitten by the bug. I worked at another small company and then another, and then I became the head of an education company that grew to become number one in the United States and was bought by a, a bigger company. Now, 2009 is, I can't, it's a decade ago. I can't believe it's already been 10 years. That was a very tough time in much of the country. How many of you were here in New Hampshire 10 years ago? And how was that for you in Nashville? Nine. You're, you're laughing. Were you the mayor then? <laughs> I just want to commend all, all of the uh, elected officials and former elected officials, because here in New Hampshire in particular, it's a labor of love. You're certainly not doing it for the money or the, the glory. Uh, and I tell people who run for local office, I believe it's harder than running for president, because people know where you live. <laughs> So the financial crisis 10 years ago racked many of our communities. And I, I saw this unfold, and I thought I had some insight as to why the economy had collapsed. It was because so many of the wannabe whiz kids I'd gone to Exeter and Brown and Columbia with had gone to Wall Street and helped create derivatives and mortgage-backed securities and these exotic financial instruments. And so I thought, well, that's a disaster. That's a train wreck if that's where our energies are going. So I imagined what I would want our energies to go towards instead. And the vision I came up with was to head to a city like Detroit or Cleveland or Birmingham or Providence and help grow a company to create jobs. So I started a nonprofit called Venture for America, started calling wealthy friends, asking them this question, do you love America? The smart among them said, what does it mean if I say yes, Andrew? And then I said at least $10,000. <laughs> So raised a couple hundred thousand dollars, which grew to the millions, helped create thousands of jobs in 15 cities around the country. And as Tracy said, I was honored by the Obama administration multiple times. I got to bring my wife to meet the president. So my in-laws were very excited about me that week. <laughs> But unfortunately, during my travels, I started having this sinking feeling where for any job that my organization was helping to create, many of these communities were losing dozens, even hundreds of jobs. I started to feel like my work was pouring water into a bathtub that had a giant hole ripped in the bottom. But I was still surprised when Donald Trump became our president in 2016. How did you all react when he won? Tears devastated, disbelief. To me, it was a giant red flag that tens of millions of our fellow Americans decided to take a bet on the narcissist reality TV star as president. And even if you were devastated or cried, we all have family members or friends or neighbors who were very excited about his victory. I started to dig into why I thought he won. If you turned on cable news today, why would you think that Donald Trump's our president? Facebook, racism, racism, Russia, Hillary Clinton, perhaps, emails. But someone shouted out the economy. That's closer to the truth. When I dug into the numbers, we've automated away 4 million new factory jobs over the past number of years. And where were those jobs? Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, 
Iowa, all of the swing states that Donald Trump needed to win and did win. And if you doubt this, if you go through the voter district data, you see that there's a straight line up between the adoption of industrial automation in a voting district and the movement towards Trump. This happened in New Hampshire, but it happened earlier. You all lost over 12,000 manufacturing jobs in the northern part of the state. And when you go to those towns, you see that mo many of those towns have never recovered. That after the factory, the plant closed, then the shopping district closed, and the population shrank. When I was in Detroit, and Cleveland, and St. Louis, you saw a lot of the same things. We're in the midst of the greatest economic transformation in the history of our country, because what happened to the manufacturing jobs is not stopping there. It's now heading to retail, call centers, fast food, truck driving, and on and on through the economy. How many of you have noticed stores closing around where you live here in New Hampshire? And why are those stores closing? Amazon. Amazon that's right. One word answer. Amazon so dollars in business every single year. How much did Amazon pay in taxes last year? Zero, that's your math, New Hampshire. 20 billion out, zero back. 30% of your stores and malls close. Most common job in the economy is retail clerk. Average retail clerk's a 39-year-old woman making between nine and $10 an hour. So if her store closes, what is her next opportunity going to be? How many of you have seen a self-serve kiosk in a fast food restaurant, like a McDonald's? Every location in the country in the next two years. The starting they're gonna move to the back of the house. When you call a customer service line of a big company and you get the bot or a software, I'm sure you do the exact same thing I do, which is you pound zero, 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 say human, human, until you get someone on the line, right? How many of you do that? <laughs> yeah, the software is terrible. But in two or three short years, the software is gonna sound like this. Hello, Andrew, how's it going? What can I do for you? It'll be fast, seamless, delightful. You might not even realize it's software. What is that gonna mean for the two and a half million Americans who work at call centers right now making $14 an hour? How many of you know a truck driver here in New Hampshire? It's the most common job in 29 states. There are three and a half million truckers. And my friends in California are working on trucks that can drive themselves. They say they're 98% of the way there. A self-driving truck just took 20 tons of butter from California to Pennsylvania about two weeks ago. Totally autonomous. Why butter? I have no idea. But you can actually look that up. You can just say robot butter truck and it, it will pop up. What does this mean for the three and a half million Americans who drive a truck for a living or the seven million Americans who work in truck stops, motels, and diners that rely upon the truckers getting out and having a meal every day? Despair. These are the forces that are tearing our country apart. Many Americans feel themselves getting left behind and pushed to the sideline. Corporate profits are at record highs today, also at record highs in the United States of America. Stress, financial insecurity. How many of you all are college students? I sense many of you. Student loan debt, record highs, not normal. Even suicides and drug overdoses, and unfortunately, New Hampshire is one of the epicenters of the opiate epidemic in the country. But eight Americans are dying of drugs every hour in this country right now. So these are the things that people are experiencing on the ground, and it's only going to accelerate as artificial intelligence leaves the lab and starts hitting the economy in earnest. This is not just a blue collar problem. Artificial intelligence will be able to do the work of bookkeepers, accountants, radiologists, even attorneys. Right now, software can edit a contract more quickly and error free and certainly inexpensively than the most experienced human lawyer. We're in the midst of this economic transformation, and for whatever reason, we're scapegoating immigrants for things that immigrants have next to nothing to do with. So my first move was still not to run for president, because I'm not a crazy person. I went to Washington, D.C., and I sat down with our leaders, and I said, what are we going to do to help our people manage this transition? And what do you think the folks in D.C. said to me when I said, what are we going to do? We don't know nothing. The three answers I got most frequently were, number one, Andrew, we cannot talk about this. Someone suggested Americans wouldn't understand it anyway. Number two, we should study this further. Number three, we must educate and retrain all Americans for the jobs of the future, which sounds very responsible. How many of you heard a politician say something like that at some point? Yeah, we all have. But then I said, look, I checked the studies. Do you all want to guess how effective the government-funded retraining programs were for the manufacturing workers who lost their jobs? 
I'm anchoring you low because it is low. Zero to 15% success rates, total dud. And when I said this to the folks in DC, one of them said, well, I guess we'll get better at it. The truth is that the folks in DC will do well whether we do well or not. The feedback mechanism is broken. It's one reason why Donald Trump's our president today. And one person in DC leveled with me and said something that brought me here to you all. He said, Andrew, you're in the wrong town. No one here will do anything about this because Washington DC is fundamentally a town of followers, not leaders. And the only way we will do something about this is if you were to create a wave in other parts of the country and bring that wave crashing down on our heads. That was over two years ago. I said, I will be back with the wave. I accept that challenge. And I stand before you today, I'm fifth in the polls to be the nominee of the Democratic Party. We raised $10 million last quarter in increments of only $30 each. So my fans are almost as cheap as Bernie's. <laughs> and that 10 million, zero corporate PAC money, all people powered, all grassroots. We just announced today that we're gonna do better than that in this coming quarter. We are growing while other campaigns are shrinking because we are solving the actual problems that got Donald Trump elected and we have real solutions that would help move the country forward. So what are the solutions? If you're here today and I appreciate you braving the elements and saying I'm going to go see Andrew Yang even though it's yucky because it's pretty gross out even, you know, I, I mean I, I grew up in New Hampshire too, so. <laughs> If you were here today, at some point you heard that this guy wants to give every American $1,000 a month. Remember the first time you heard that? And the first time you heard that, you were like, ha ha, that's a gimmick, that's too good to be true, that will never happen. But this is not my idea and it's not a new idea. Thomas Paine was for it at the founding of the country, he called it the citizen's dividend. Martin Luther King fought for it in the 1960s, called it the guaranteed minimum income for all Americans. And it is what he was fighting for when he was assassinated in 1968. I had the privilege of sitting with Dr. King's son in Atlanta, Martin Luther King III, who said, this is what my father was fighting for when he was killed. A thousand economists endorsed it in the 60s. It passed the US House of Representatives twice in 71 under Richard Nixon. It's called the Family Assistance Plan, would have set an income floor for all Americans. And then 11 years later, one state passed a dividend where now everyone in that state gets between one and $2,000 a year, no questions asked. And what state is that, New Hampshire? Alaska. And how does Alaska pay for it? Oil. And what is the oil of the 21st century? technology, AI, software, self-driving cars and trucks. A study just came out that said that our data is now worth more than oil. How many of you saw that study? How many of you got your data check in the mail? We laugh, but where did the data checks go? Facebook, Amazon, Google, the mega tech companies that are paying zero or near zero in taxes. That is the game, New Hampshire. Our communities are getting sucked dry and depleted. We're looking around wondering where the value went. And the biggest winners in the 21st century economy are paying zero in taxes. What we have to do is we have to get our fair share, your fair share, make sure Amazon, this trillion dollar tech company, actually is paying taxes. And equally important, we have to put that value into our hands, into your hands, the hands of the American people. Build a trickle economy from our people, our families, and our communities up. Because if we put this $1,000 a month into your hands, where will the money go in real life? I'm gonna guess a lot of it's gonna stay right here in Nashua or New Hampshire, right? It's be good for the Chamber of Commerce. You run a business here, it'd be like, wow, I think people might be patronizing my business a little more often. But the money would go into car repairs you've been putting off and daycare expenses and little league signups and local nonprofits and religious organizations. It would create a, a sustainable path for rural parts of the state that right now are struggling to find it. It would make our people stronger, healthier, mentally healthier, less stressed out. For the students who are laboring under tens of thousands of dollars in student loan debt, it would help to clear that debt. Though I want to do more to clear that debt independent of giving you a thousand bucks a month. Because that 1.6 trillion is out of control and it's immoral the way it was generated. This thousand dollars a month would help us manage the greatest economic transformation in our country's history. I am friendly with some of the leading technologists in the country. They tell me, hey, Andrew, I've seen what's in the lab. And when it comes out, it's going to be 
a bigger problem than anyone realizes. You know how that conversation never goes? Andrew, I've seen what's in the lab and everything will be fine. That's not the end of that thought. The more someone knows, the more concerned they are. The folks in DC are decades behind the curve on technology in particular. They got rid of the Office of Technology Assessment in 1995. Congress has literally had zero input on technology issues for 24 years, aside from the tech companies themselves. And you can guess what the tech companies have been telling them. So these are the changes that we have to make to rewrite the rules of the 21st century economy to work for us, to work for you. If you're a young person, you feel like it's not working for you, you're right, it is not working for you. If you were born in the 1940s in the United States of America, there was a 93% chance you were gonna do better than your parents. That's the American dream. That's the American dream that drew my parents here. If you were born in the 1990s, which is some of you, you're down to a 50-50 shot and the number is declining quick. That's why young people in particular feel like we've left you an economy that doesn't work for you, a mess in addition to climate change, and we have. If you're a young person and you feel distressed or angry about it, I get it. We owe you better. We have to do better for you. We have to start measuring how our economy is doing based upon how you all are doing to see how it's working. Again, corporate profits at record highs while our life expectancy is declining. Which is more important? Yes, I agree. <laughs> And if you think about how we're measuring the value that we're producing, my wife is at home with our two young boys, one of whom is autistic. What is her work included at in our economic measures? Zero. And we know that's nonsense. We know the work she's doing is among the most challenging and important work that anyone does. It's not just her work. The things that we value most are progressively getting zeroed out in American life. It's parenting, yes, nurturing, caregiving, volunteering, mentoring, coaching, increasingly arts, increasingly journalism, and our market is going to systematically undervalue the work done by women and underrepresented minorities in particular. We all knew that, know that women do more of the unrecognized and uncompensated work in our society every single day. So by properly measuring our progress, we can actually see the depth of the problems and then start working to improve on them. So if GDP is this phantom measurement that has less and less relationship with how we're doing, and even its inventor said 100 years ago, this is a terrible measurement of national well-being and we should never use it as that, what would a measurement that actually measures how you and your family are doing look like? Like what would that measurement be? Contributions to your community included. Yeah, you could. You could do something around civic engagement. How about mental health and freedom from substance abuse? How about health and life expectancy? Ability to retire with dignity? Clean air and clean water? We can actually make these the measurements of our society. And as your president, that's exactly what I'll do. I'll say GDP is 100 years old. It's time for an upgrade. It's past overdue. And here's how we will measure our, our progress now. And then we would see we're in a mental health crisis. We would see we're in a wellness recession. We would see that our environment is getting worse and worse. And it's not included in our current numbers. How many of you all have run a business or division. Imagine if you had the wrong measurements for that organization. How would it do over time? That is where we are right now as a country. We're getting beaten over the head with GDP, headline unemployment, and stock market prices, and none of those things has much of a relationship with how we're actually doing. GDP I talked about a little bit. Stock market prices, the bottom 80% of Americans own 8% of stock market wealth. The bottom 50% own essentially zero. Stock market prices correspond to the top 20% of society if you're generous. And headline unemployment doesn't include the fact that millions are dropping out of the workforce, that people are doing two or three jobs to get by, and that 40% of recent college grads are doing a job that doesn't require a college degree. So if we get the measurements right, we can actually make progress. Donald Trump said in 2016 he was going to make America great again. And what did Hillary Clinton say in response? America's already great. You remember that, New Hampshire? It has been a long several years, I know. We have to acknowledge that the problems are real. 
and that they are deep in our communities, but we need solutions that would actually help people and move us forward. What were Donald Trump's solutions? I'm gonna build a wall, I'm gonna turn the clock back, I'm gonna bring the old jobs back. New Hampshire, we have to do the opposite of these things. We have to turn the clock forward. We have to accelerate our economy and society as quickly as possible to rise the real challenges of this era. We have to evolve in the way we think about ourselves and our work and our value. And I am the ideal candidate for this job because the opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian man who likes math. Thank you very much, Nashua. Thank you, math is an acronym. What does it stand for? Make America think harder, that's right, that is your job. You're going to help us move the country, not left, not right, but forward. Thank you very, very much.